Dear Church, let's talk about work. Hello and welcome to the Dear Church podcast. I'm your host, Chris McCurley. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you're noticing that uh, I'm the only one in the seat today. There is no guest. For the next few weeks, we're looking at uh, a three-part series entitled Work, Rest, and Play. It all matters to God. And just like the title uh, implies, we're going to be looking at different aspects of our lives, the three major aspects, work, rest, and play. And we're going to be talking about how all of it matters to God, how He's interested in every bit of it. And we're going to start uh, today with work. Uh, do you remember Mars bars, the candy bar? Um, you remember their slogan from a long time ago, a Mars a day helps you work, rest, and play, I think is how it went, something like that. These advertisers were, were pretty smart with, with this because they understood that we value all things, that our whole world kind of revolves around work, rest, and play. Again, those are the biggest aspects of our life. But unfortunately for many of us, work greatly overshadows the other two. Uh, it, work is the bigger virtue in our lives so many times. It would be nice if rest and play were the two areas that dominated our lives, but sadly, that is rarely the case. In fact, most of us would settle for an equal split, I think, but alas, work um, is the one that dominates our lives all too often. Do you love your work? Do you like your work? Do you feel imprisoned by your work? Maybe you do. If so, if you feel like you're in prison by your work, think about this. In prison, you spend the majority of your time in a 10 by 10 cell. At work, you spend the majority of your time in a 10 by 10 cubicle or office. In prison, you get three free meals a day, but at work, you get a break for one meal and you have to pay for it. In prison, you get time off for good behavior, but at work, you get more work for good behavior, it seems. In prison, the guard locks and unlocks all the doors for you. At work, you must often carry a security card and open all the doors for yourself. In prison, you can watch TV and play games. At work, you could get fired for watching TV and playing games. In prison, they allow your family and friends to visit. At work, you aren't even supposed to speak to your family many times. In prison, all expenses are paid by the taxpayers with no work required. But at work, you pay all your expenses to go to work and they deduct taxes from your salary to pay for prisoners. In prison, you must deal with maybe a sadistic warden. At work, they're called managers. Now, obviously that was kind of tongue in cheek, it was a joke, but for some, the difference between work and, and prison is oh so slight. Some feel trapped in their job. Some dread going to work every day. Some recite the words of Mark Twain, who once said, work is a necessary evil to be avoided. Others really enjoy their job, maybe even too much. They spend every waking minute at their job, and when they do eventually come home, they bring their work with them. Some are what we would call a workaholic. You know, whatever we spend the most time doing is what will make the most what, what will make the most important thing in our lives. Whatever you give the most time to is what you're gonna value the most. And when your life revolves around work, you become shaped by your work. Workaholics are so dedicated to their career and to the pursuit of money and to climbing the corporate ladder that they forfeit time with their family oftentimes. Their marriage suffers, their children suffer, their spiritual life suffers. Of course, some workaholics, in order to support the other two values that we're talking about, they, they work so hard that they can play hard so that they can rest. It takes money to buy the toys that we enjoy playing with. And as we all know, this money doesn't just fall out of the sky. You have to work for it. Some people work really hard so that they can live a life of luxury. But what if we took a, a different approach to work? What if we viewed work differently? What if we saw our work as God's work? Do you think Jesus made some really quality tables and chairs? You're thinking, Chris, what in the world are you talking about? You just shifted gears there without any warning. But uh, think about it. Do you think Jesus made some really quality furniture? Do you think he, saw, uh, he was ever tempted to look at his work and, and glorify himself rather than glorify God? I, I think Jesus knew that carpentry was a means to an end. Being a carpenter 
is what he did, not who he was. We know him as the Messiah, but you realize that Jesus spent the majority of his life working as a carpenter. Even the Son of God was not above work. Not only did Jesus work, but God worked. Psalm 8 and 3 reads, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained. Psalm 139 tells of how we, as his creation, are intricately woven in our mother's womb, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 104 and verse 24 states, O Lord, how many are your works, and wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. And of course, the book of Genesis opens with the creation account detailing for us the handiwork of God as he worked for six days and rested on the seventh. So Jesus worked, God worked, and we find numerous examples throughout scripture of God's people working. Whether it was building the temple or rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, God's people were commissioned to work. So based on these examples from scripture, we can rightly say that work is good, at least in one sense, right? Some have claimed that work is bad. They refer back to the curse placed upon man after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Verses 17 through 19 of Genesis chapter 3 reads like this. It says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you, and toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So, work was a curse. Well, consider what is written in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. It reads, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. You know, work is not necessarily a four-letter word. Work was a part of man's existence from the very beginning. We were hardwired to work. You could say we were created to work. It's not that work is a curse, although you might feel like it at times. It's that work intensified after the fall of man. We could say that work got harder because of sin. Like everything else that God created in the beginning, the fact that Adam would labor in the garden was a good thing. However, because of sin, something designed to be good became difficult. And we see that to be the case with so many things in life. Even as human beings, we can take something good, and we often do take something good that God created, and we pervert it. Work can still be difficult today. I know many of you that are listening or watching probably have a very rewarding and fulfilling job. I am one of those who loves, loves, loves my job. But a love for work can be a major problem as well. We, we can work so hard at our job that it becomes an idol. So we begin to worship our work. We bow down to a career and diligent pursuit of the American dream. We become the standard bearer for our field. We make a lot of money and we receive massive notoriety. We're remembered on earth as a huge success, but someday we stand before God trying to give an account for our life. You know, in Genesis chapter 11, we find God's people hard at work. Remember this episode in Genesis chapter 11, after the flood, God starts over with Noah's descendants, and God tells them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, the descendants of Noah had a very different idea. They had this vision of a world all their own. So rather than scattering over the entire earth, they, they cling together, they glob together, and they decide to unite in an effort to build this massive tower reaching up to heaven. This is what they had come to. From Eden to the first murder to widespread violence, and now to this crazy idea of building a tower. As they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And since they all spoke the same language, they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. Genesis chapter 11, verses 3 and following, tells us that they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Now, I want you to notice their reason for taking on this grandiose endeavor. It says, and let us make for ourselves a name. That's the key. By building something great, 
They would make a great name for themselves. They would build something that, could, that they could be proud of, something that would reach high into the sky for all to see from very far away, something that would tower over all the other cities, something that, could, that they could stand back from and say, wow, look, look at what we made. What a great legacy we're building here. It would be something that people would be impressed with for centuries to come. They were not only building a city or a tower, they were, they were building this legacy. And they were assuring that their name would carry on for years and years to come. That people would always remember that they were the ones. They were the, the, the ones that built this magnificent tower. They were the tower builders. And future generations would certainly be just as impressed with their efforts as they were of themselves. But in all their egotistical and proud exertion, they never stopped to consider that maybe all this tower building was a bad idea. The one they should have been concerned with impressing was not impressed. They were going to build this magnificent tower to heaven, yet the God in heaven was not amused. They became self-absorbed, self-centered, and self-sufficient, united in a proud attempt to, to take destiny into their own hands, to seize the reins of history. There was no limit to their unrestrained rebellion realizing that the only thing that they could do in greatness was sin, God had to step in. And he does so by confusing their language. He scatters them abroad over the entire earth, and their building plans were thwarted because they were trying to become great on their own. And greatness comes from following God, not from doing our own thing. But when we live to work, then all our life revolves around our work. Work becomes an idol, and we're willing to sacrifice just about anything, whatever it takes to worship this idol. I am what I do becomes our mantra. And someone asks you, so, so what do you do? You ever been asked that question? So what do you do? And the response is often, well, I'm a teacher, I'm a police officer, I'm a housewife. But you're not. You're not those things. Those things are what you do. They're not who you are. You're not identified by your work. When we work to live, we're merely doing a job to get the things that we want. We're using our work to support a lifestyle or an identity. This is typical of those who are working for the weekend or pursuing the American dream or the next vacation or the pursuit of happiness. When you work to live, then work becomes an avenue to get leisure or more stuff. But both working to live and living to work are rooted in false identities. And they breed things like self-promotion, self-importance. In other words, we become the centerpiece. We become the show. That's what happened to the workers on the plain of Shinar. They worked hard, but their work was all about self-promotion and for the purpose of self-recognition. The logic of Babel says, I'm going to build a great name for myself. I'm going to build a wonderful legacy. I I'm going to build a magnificent life. And the key to it all is the word I. You see, the logic of Babel is built on self. Rebellious man undertook a united, godless endeavor to establish themselves as world-renowned. But their efforts were in vain, because no matter how many people they impressed, it was God's favor they should have been seeking. God was not involved in their work. There was a purpose to what they were doing, but it wasn't God's purpose, and therefore it was all in vain. It's time that we look at work differently, that we take a lesson from the logic of Babel. Our work matters to God, and God matters to our work. And we need to see our work the way God sees it. Turn over to Colossians chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, and I want you to notice what Paul writes. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 22. It says, Slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Now, realize that these words are in the context of the slave-master relationship. However, there are some vital principles in this passage pertaining to our work that apply just as much today. And the main thing I wanna zero in on is this phrase, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. 
The word heartily here in the Greek is the word cardia, which refers to the chief organ of physical life. It can also represent man's entire mental and moral activity. It can mean vigor or zeal and willingness. In Colossians 3.23, heartily is the Greek word suke, preceded by the Greek word ek or ek sukes. I'm sure I butchered that, but it means out of the soul. In other words, let your work come from the heart and the soul. Don't just do the bare minimum. Do your best. Work for the real master. Remember, he's your boss. Make him proud as you work hard. But let's ask this question. Why, why does work matter to God? Is it because he likes clean floors? Does God suffer with OCD? Does he suffer with OCD about the things of this earth? He just can't stand it when the windows aren't clean? Does he get pleasure from seeing you lift those heavy boxes or, or measure and cut that board perfectly on the first try? I don't think so. No, I, I think Paul's words are an extension of what he's already been talking about in his letter. The preceding chapters set up what Paul is discussing in chapter 3. Chapters 1 and 2 talk about who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and who the people now are in Christ. So let's look at it. Who is Jesus? Well, verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Again, chapters 1 and 2 set up chapter 3. This is Colossians 1, 15 through 20. This is who Jesus is. Then you move over to what Jesus has done. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, that's what Jesus has done. Now, look at who we are now. We are saints, Colossians 1, 23. We are qualified to share in the inheritance, Colossians 1 and 12. We are reconciled as well as holy and blameless and beyond reproach. That's verse 22 of Colossians 1. We are alive and forgiven. That's Colossians 2 and verse 13. We are being renewed in the image of our creator, Colossians 3.10. And we have been given a new identity and a new purpose. It's Colossians 2 and verse 6 as well as Colossians 3, verse 1 and verse 17. So who is Jesus? What has Jesus done? And who are we now in Christ? You know what? All those things should affect our work. They should. Our work matters to God. And because of this, God should matter to our work. What if our work pointed to who we believe God is, what he has done for us, and who we are now? I mean, think about this. Why work hard at your job? Why? I mean, why work hard at your job? Is it to earn a paycheck? Is it so you can climb the corporate ladder? Is it so you can make money to give to those in need? What if it was to be salt and light in the world? Why work hard at school? Is it so I can get a degree? What if it was for the purpose of using that degree to help others in my chosen field of endeavor? What if I began looking at my job as a ministry rather than just a way to make money? Why work hard at parenting? Is it to raise good kids? What if it was to raise them for the purpose of making an impact for the kingdom? What if we sought to raise our kids to be preachers and missionaries and Bible class teachers and deacons and elders? Why work, why, why work hard at church? Is it because I'm supposed to? Is it so I can be recognized? So I can feel better about myself? Or is it so I can continue the work of Jesus in a world that so desperately needs him? Is it because it's a lifestyle and not merely something I feel obligated to do? When I understand that I am working for the Lord, I can use my job and my skills 
to further his kingdom and not mine. I can look for ways to bless others at work because I know I've been infinitely blessed. I can be a better coworker, more gracious, patient, and forgiving. I can have a busy day, but I don't have to have a busy heart. I can rest assured that my job doesn't own me, that I am owned by Christ. He's my real boss. Again, you are not what you do. You're a Christian, a worker for the Lord. Your identity is found in Jesus, not in a job. You don't live to work. You don't work to live. You work as for the Lord. And your work should be an avenue by which you can illuminate Christ, who He is, what He has done, and who you are now because of Him. I believe this. I believe Christians should be the best employees, which means that we're on time, we don't settle for mediocrity, we treat our coworkers, our boss with respect, we're honest, we're compassionate, we're forgiving, we're humble and we're selfless, we work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Someone stated it like this, they said, if you're an accountant, you crunch those numbers as if you're doing Jesus's tax returns. If you're a car salesman, you act, you act as if you're selling a car to Jesus. If you're a construction manager, you act as if it's Jesus' house you're building. If you're a teacher, the Jesus is one of your students. If you're a sanitation worker, you pick up every last piece of garbage because it's Jesus' streets you're keeping clean. If you're a waiter, you're not working for tips, you're going the extra mile because Jesus is your customer. You see, God is your boss. You may have a great boss in your job. You may have a terrible boss, I don't know. Either way, you need to know who your real boss is. Rethink your work and let it reshape your life. Think in terms of gospel-shaped work. You may spend a lifetime constructing a tower of wealth, of status, of material possessions, of notoriety, and that tower may bring you a powerful name among your peers. It may provide you the much needed security that you desire, but is God impressed? That's the question. It's not about how big a tower we can build here on earth. It's about trusting in God to lead us, to provide for us, and to protect us along the way. Our security and our identity are found in the Lord. Who we are is because of who He is. And the work we do, no matter how difficult, no matter how mundane, important, or insignificant it may seem, it should be about making God proud. I mean, imagine the difference we could make if all Christians allowed their work to be shaped by the gospel. What if we looked at everything in life, including our work, as a ministry? What could we accomplish for the kingdom if we made our work about pleasing the divine boss. You know, as a preacher, <clears throat> I get a lot of interesting comments on my sermons. Some are serious, some are lighthearted, some are made in jest. I, I don't mind at all. I, I hope that uh, as, as a preacher, I can have some fun and I hope that I don't take anything too seriously. And if it's a criticism, I hope that I can filter out the good and leave out the bad. I don't mind people having fun at my expense, which happens quite often at Oldham Lane. In fact, that's one of the reasons I love Oldham Lane. But one of the comments that I hear quite often is, well, you're the preacher. You only have to work one day a week. And while I've heard that comment more than once, I still chuckle and act like it's funny. I know the person saying it doesn't mean anything by it. At least I don't think they do. Or on occasion, a church member will call me, and when I answer the phone, they'll say something like, you awake? I've had church members sincerely ask, so, so what do you do all week? Tom Rayner once did a little experiment at the church where he was preaching, and he listed several congregational responsibilities, and he asked 12 members at his church to share the minimum amount of time that he, the preacher, should spend on average in each area each week. He found that in order to meet the minimum expectations, he had to fulfill the following responsibilities each week. Prayer at the church, 14 hours. Sermon preparation, 18 hours. Outreach and evangelism, 10 hours. <coughs> Excuse me, counseling, 10 hours. Hospital and home visits, 15 hours. Administrative functions, 18 hours. Community involvement, 5 hours. Church meetings, 
five hours, worship services slash preaching, four hours, and then other duties, 10 hours for a grand total of 114 hours per week. And Rainer pointed out that he would have to work more than 16 hours a day for seven days a week in order to fulfill just the minimum expectations. <clears throat> I personally thank our elders for never doing such a survey at Oldham Lane. And I thank our members for not placing unrealistic demands upon me and my time. As a preacher, I have learned something that has helped me tremendously in my daily work, and it's this. God is the CEO. I work for Him. Not the elders, not the members. But here's the thing. If I work diligently to please the head of this church, the elders will never have to, elders will never have to worry about the amount of time I spend fulfilling my responsibilities. The members will get my very best week in and week out. When the boss is happy, Everybody wins. You know, maybe you face some difficult circumstances in your job. Perhaps your boss is placing unrealistic expectations upon you. Maybe it's long hours and high stress, or maybe you're in a job that is very satisfying. Perhaps you thoroughly enjoy your job. Maybe you're somewhat indifferent. You're like, oh, it's a job, you know, I can take it or leave it. Whatever your situation, I encourage you to remember who you work for. And remember why you work. It's not simply to earn a paycheck or to buy more stuff or to build a nest egg. Our work was designed by God. And like anything else in life, our work should be about glorifying God. So I, I want to encourage all of us to engage in gospel-shaped work. Let's make our work about making a difference. I appreciate you so much tuning in. If you have questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at chris.mccurley at rippleoflight.com. Spread the news about the podcast. We're, we're gathering a following slowly but surely. Uh, I realize that you know our podcast may not be for everybody, but, but hopefully we have a message in there for someone. So share the news about it. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcast. And again, if you have any questions, let me know. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you sincerely. Chris.